Good afternoon, the Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service in the District of Columbia. Hearing will now come to order. Welcome, Ranking Member Chaffetz, members of the Subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all those in attendance. In light of the District of Columbia's ongoing efforts to minimize the amount of lead in its water, particularly since the 2000 to 2004 lead in the water crisis, I've called today's hearing to look into how the district and the federal government can reduce the amount of lead that D.C. residents are exposed to and to learn what steps, if any, should be taken to identify children exposed to lead during the lead in the water crisis. The chair, the ranking member, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. I now yield myself five minutes for my opening statement. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, let me welcome you to the subcommittee's oversight hearing entitled Lead Exposure in D.C., Prevention, Protection, and Potential Prescriptions. From a health and safety perspective, today's hearing provides the subcommittee with an important opportunity to take a prospective look at issues of, of lead and lead exposure in D.C. and to discuss what district and federal government can do to help protect the more than 600,000 District of Columbia residents and the millions of people that visit our nation's capital every year. There's an old saying that the only good lead is no lead, and although we may never actually meet the objective standard, given the various sources of lead that exist, I do believe it's critical that we continue to work to limit and reduce the level of exposure of D.C. residents, particularly of infants and children, uh, particularly susceptible population, as well as to fully inform the public about their options if exposure to lead does occur. Today's hearing is also intended to look at what steps, if any, should be taken to identify and assist those previously exposed to lead during the district's lead in the water crisis. As many of you are aware, from 2000 to 2004, the D.C. lead in the water crisis threatened the district's drinking water, with an estimated 4,000 District of Columbia homes having lead in their water that exceeded the federal limit of 15 parts per billion. While a host of work has been performed since the early 2000s uh, to limit the district residents' exposure to lead, the seriousness of the previous crisis warrants ongoing oversight and examination, which is why I believe today's hearing is one of the most important proceedings this subcommittee will hold during the 111th Congress. It's my hope that today's hearing will examine a myriad of topics and questions ranging from current practices to treat and deliver quality, high-quality drinking water uh, to residents of the district, to recent improvements in agency coordination and the dissemination of accurately, excuse me, accurate and timely information to the public about whether or not their homes are at risk to exposure to lead and to look into what actions can be taken to ensure the prevention of another crisis. I'd like to thank my colleague, the Honorable Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, for her years of work on this issue. Please know that the subcommittee looks forward to continuing to work with you and others related uh, who are concerned about this problem as we collectively look for ways to prevent, protect, and prescribe possible solutions for those who may or may have been or are exposed to lead in the District of Columbia. Uh, again, I thank all of those in attendance this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing our, the testimony of our witnesses. I'd like now uh, to take a moment to introduce uh, the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you, I, I stand by your assertion, you are correct, that one of the basic tenets here, one of the basic things we should do is make sure that the water is safe for our children and for the people who are going to consume it from all over the world as they visit the, the District of Columbia. People expect their drinking water to be safe, abundant, and inexpensive. Sadly, here in the nation's capital, the safety of our drinking water has been an ongoing concern. Now, clearly, there is a major federal role in the quest for safe drinking water in the Washington region. Congress has done extensive oversight and legislation has been enacted. Our goal is to basically make sure that the lead is out. Though not one of the leading tourist attractions in the Washington, D.C. area, the Blue Plains Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant is the largest such facility in the world. On the banks of the Anacostia, this, it is a key to having a healthy Potomac River and Chesapeake Bay. I recognize that I'm still a freshman here, but I do understand that not too many years ago there would be pitchers of water with drinking glasses supplied to members and witnesses at congressional hearings. And I noticed that today we have bottles of water on the table. The, back then there were boil water alerts in Washington and signs in this very building cautioning people against drinking the water from the water fountains. And yet now, as we pointed out, we have 
bottled water. And so the Water and Sewer Authority was created as a quasi-regional entity, and as recently as 2008, Congress enacted legislation to preserve its independence. WASA operates Blue Plains. As of De April 2009, WASA has a new general manager who is here with us today, and we, we appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here. WASA supplies wholesale wastewater treatment for over 2 million local residents and millions of visitors. It has over 500,000 retail, commercial, and federal customers. The Washington Aqueduct, the Pentagon, the Reagan National Airport are all closely linked to WASA. In 2004, the WASA board hired a leading law firm, Covington and Burling, to investigate its management of lead monitoring activities from July 2000 to J January 2004 due to elevated lead levels in local water supply. That, in that investigation, interestingly enough, was conducted under the direction of now U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. Some of our witnesses today have testified before our predecessors in the sub subcommittee and before the full committee. It's shocking that a congressional investigation recently concluded that Centers for Disease Control and Prevention made, quote, scientifically indefensible, end quote, claims in 2004 relative to the dangers some local residents were exposed to by drinking public water. That's something we'd like to hear about more in this committee and hopefully here today. Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you again for calling this hearing. Look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Appreciate you all being here and look forward to your, your testimony and the question and answer afterwards. Yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, who has been a driving force behind this, this hearing and, uh, and, and trying to correct a, a very difficult situation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and I particularly appreciate your you quickly uh, holding a hearing on this important public health issue. Uh, the hearing is, I believe, uh, important for its national implications as well because of the effects of lead on children and pregnant women in particular, just as the earlier lead in the water crisis from 2000 to 2004 resulted in national attention on the issue uh, and the introduction of legislation in Congress. This hearing will take a broad prospective look at lead in D.C. to learn not only about reduction of lead exposure in the district, but also what steps, if any, can and should be taken to identify and treat children and adults who were exposed to lead during the district's lead in the water crisis. This crisis became public in 2004 and caused considerable concern in the city. At my request, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform held hearings on this issue, and a number of other congressional committees did as well. Two months ago, the lead in the water crisis reemerged in public consciousness uh, when the majority staff of the House Science and Technology Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight released a critical investigation report making out the case that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had misrepresented harm caused to D.C. the lead in the water crisis. Uh, this hearing um, uh, is, is a follow-up uh, to the uh, SNI subcommittee report. Uh, and I think, Mr. Chairman, it is necessary because the emergence once again of this issue has caused D.C. residents to be concerned about lead in the water, that old crisis, and what are its implications for today. Uh, we call to the attention of residents that for the past several years, however, lead in the water has been below the U.S. Environmental Protection agency action level of 15 parts per billion. However, the subcommittee report raised questions about whether public officials misled intentionally or otherwise and continue to mislead the public about the lead in the water crisis. These questions need clarifications and the CDC has indicated too that mistakes were made. But the more urgent goal of today's hearing, I believe, Mr. Chairman, is to look forward at what we should do about the children and the pregnant women who may have been exposed during the lead in the water crisis and what steps we can take to overcome, to ensure rather, that DC residents are safe now from lead in the water, lead in paint, and from other sources. The DC Water and Sewer Authority, or WASA, first became aware of the high levels 
of lead in the water in 2002. However, it was only when the Washington Post ran a story in early 2004 that the public became aware of the full scope of the problem. At that time, it was estimated that 4,000 uh, district homes had lead in the water that exceeded the EPA action level of 15 parts per billion, and that the city had 23,000 homes with lead service line. Fear spread through the district. In response to the lead in the water crisis and pursuant to federal law, uh, the district sought to replace all of the approximately 35,000 known utility lead service lines in the District of Columbia by 2016. At congressional hearings in 2004 and 2008, I questioned Wasser's response to the lead in the water crisis of proceeding with partial lead pipe replacements. There was no evidence at the time, and to my knowledge, there is no evidence today that such a measure would reduce lead in drinking water. In fact, CDC's own research suggests that partial lead pipe replacements actually may increase the amount of lead in the water. However, WASA spent $100 million on partial pipe replacements in the district. We are very concerned that while WASA has considerably reduced the number of such partial replacements, it continues to perform them. We need to look for new science-based approaches to rebuild confidence in the agencies responsible for preventing lead contamination. Most of our witnesses today are charged with the task of improving public health here in the district and nationally. Uh, the, the subcommittee, I'm sure, will be interested to learn how they are meeting this charge today, particularly as it relates to the reduction of lead exposure here, of what progress has been made, and looking toward the, the future, what changes are needed. Uh, though the focus of this hearing relates to the specific example of the District of Columbia, its findings, in my judgment, could have far-reaching consequences. The lessons learned from the lead in the water crisis here in the district already have been instructive to health professionals elsewhere. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hearing, I think, uh, important outside of the district as much as it is in the district itself. I thank the gentlelady. It is the committee's policy that all witnesses to testify must be sworn. Uh, so may I please ask you to rise and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let the record show that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. What I'd like to do is begin by offering a brief, test, uh, brief introduction of each of our witnesses on this panel, and then we'll, excuse me, uh, and then uh, we'll invite the witnesses each to, to offer uh, a brief opening statement as well. Uh, on panel one, uh, I'd like to begin by introducing Ms. Ileana Arias. Am I pronouncing that correct? Okay. That was luck, your <laughs> luck. Currently, Ileana Arias currently serves as Deputy Director as the, at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. In 2005, she was also appointed at the, as the Director of the National Center for Injury and Prevention Control. Uh, prior to joining the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2000, she was the Director of Clinical Training and a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Georgia. Uh, Mr. Thomas Jacobus has been the general manager of the Washington Aqueduct since 1994. He is responsible for overseeing one of the largest municipal water treatment operations in the nation. Prior to his arrival at Washington Aqueduct, Mr. Jacobus, a registered professional engineer, spent more than 25 years with the Army Corps of Engineers in military assignments around the world. Thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. George Hawkins has been the general manager of the D.C. Water and Sewer Authority since September of 2009. In this position, Mr. Hawkins oversees all of the D.C. Water and Sewer Authority's operations and is responsible for carrying out the strategic plan for the utility. Prior to this, Mr. Hawkins served as, excuse me, served for two and a half years as the director of the District Department of the Environment, an $80 million agency with 300 employees. Mr. Christopher Tulu was named Acting Director of the District Department of the Environment in May of this year. 
Mr. Tulu has over 10 years of experience in Congress, including his position as Cabinet Secretary for the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. He also worked as an advisor on the Clinton Climate Initiative's Carbon, Carbon and Property Reduction Project. Excuse me, Carbon and Poverty Reduction Project. Dr. Elman, Ellen Silbergeld is currently a professor and editor-in-chief of environmental research at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She received her PhD from Johns Hopkins in Geography and Environmental Engineering and a postdoctoral fellowship in environmental health sciences. She has served as a scientific advisor to the Center for Disease Control, Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Energy, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the World Bank. Welcome. Ms. Arias, you're welcome to offer a, uh, an opening statement for five minutes. Let me just explain that uh, that small box in front of you uh, will, will flash green while your time is uh, active. It will it'll flash yellow when you should begin to wrap up, and then obviously it will uh, show red when your time has expired. But welcome, and, and uh, please, you're welcome to open, offer your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today on what we consider an incredibly important issue for D.C. and for the country as a whole. I'm Dr. Eliana Arias, the Principal Deputy Director of the Centers for Disease Control and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has been mentioned. In that role, I'm primarily responsible for advising the Director, Dr. Thomas Reedon, on all scientific and programmatic activities at CDC and the ATSDR. We're here to talk today about lead. Lead is an incredibly dangerous substance. It leads to, uh, uh, unfortunately, a number of neurobehavioral effects, uh, and young children are particularly susceptible to the effects of exposure to lead. Lead exposure in the child's environment must be controlled and eliminated as much as possible. At CDC, essentially, we adopt a zero tolerance for lead, even though we recognize that removing all traces of lead in the environment may not be possible. However, we are committed to driving those numbers down as much as is feasibly possible and that we can. For nearly three decades, CDC has spearheaded an effective national lead prevention campaign. Uh, when we began about 30 years ago, 88 percent of American children tested had blood levels above 10 micrograms per deciliter. Today, we are testing children and showing that less than 1 percent uh, have those high levels of lead in their system. The changes that have taken place in the 30 years essentially constitute one of the greatest public health success stories in the United States. CDC has worked tirelessly uh, in order to accomplish this, and we haven't done it alone. We've partnered with other agencies who are equally committed to making a significant difference, such as the EPA, HUD, state and local health departments, and others. CDC recognizes the potential to eliminate childhood lead exposure, and although we have made significant strides, we are not giving up in trying to make even greater differences. Lead is a common but dangerous substance, and exposures can occur in many different ways, as already has been mentioned. Paint, dust, soil, toys, we even know now some imported candies, unfortunately, have traces of lead. We've been successful in the past in fighting it. Important pervasive sources of lead, like leaded gasoline, have been eliminated. Eliminating childhood lead exposure will require, however, targeting the most at risk, and unfortunately, that means the hardest to reach populations. We need to remain vigilant for current sources and identify new sources of lead and make sure that we address those exposures appropriately. CDC continues to work with DC to protect its children from lead exposure. Today, the DC program is a very effective at reduce, a very effective program at reducing childhood lead exposure, screening at-risk children, and ensuring that exposed children get effective case management. DC Council has adopted and implemented a lead poisoning prevention law that is one of the strongest in the nation. It requires universal screening of all one and two-year-olds in DC who are at highest risk for the negative effects of lead exposure. It also requires screening ones prior uh, the, uh, ones prior to the age of uh, six years, and also screening of children prior to daycare and school enrollment. The D.C. lead program continues to address compliance and enforcement. D.C. drinking water has been in compliance with EPA's Safe Drinking Water Act standards for lead since 2006. 
CDC works with, CD, with DC to reduce the number of DC children exposed to lead and to ensure that children who have been exposed receive appropriate case management. Children who test positive are enrolled in case management, which includes actions such as clinical follow-up, that includes medical assessment of neurodevelopment, chelation for excessive levels of blood lead, referrals for childhood development educational services. It also includes environmental follow-up, uh, in including assessment of potential sources of lead exposure and enforcement of lead hazard mitigation in homes and in the environment of the children. It also involves parent and guardian education uh, in the form of home visitation programs to not only educate parents uh, and caregivers, but also to address the hazards, uh, to assess and mitigate hazards in the home and the households uh, where children and other at-risk populations live. Enriched educational services and intellectual development programs in the DC public schools also have been incredibly helpful in responding to children who have been exposed uh, and characterized by high levels of lead in their systems. Moving forward, our focus must be on how best to protect children from lead poisoning. The CDC director, Dr. Tom Frieden, and I have met with DC leaders already, and I'm testifying today to underscore our intention and commitment to eliminate lead poisoning in children. In DC, we are working very closely with the LEAD program. We're also engaging in a number of broad national uh, activities to improve our knowledge of the state of affairs and our ability to respond very quickly to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jacobus, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am Tom Jacobus, General Manager of Washington Aqueduct. Thank you for inviting me to testify today concerning strategies for reducing lead exposure via drinking water. Washington Aqueduct is committed to ensuring that we produce safe, high quality drinking water for our customers. Every action we take as an organization is focused on achieving this. We have an exceptional record of producing and delivering safe, reliable, and cost effective water service for our customers. Washington Aqueduct is regulated by EPA Region 3, and even though we are federal in nature, we operate like every other regulated water utility. The elevated levels of lead in drinking water in some homes in the District of Columbia that were reported in the media in January 2004 were caused by a treatment change we made in November 2000. That change was made to be more protective of chronic exposure to disinfection byproducts, while at the same time keeping the water free from harmful bacteria. However, it resulted in unforeseen changes to the corrosion control measures being used. As a result, the water in contact with the lead service lines was too reactive and the lead was leached from those lines. A technical solution to restore effective corrosion control was researched and tested and then applied to the treatment process and delivered to the entire distribution system in August 2004. By adding orthophosphate as the corrosion inhibitor, lead levels measured at the tap in accordance with the Safe Drinking Water Act's lead and copper rule began dropping as predicted. The use of a chemical additive as a corrosion inhibitor in the Washington Aqueduct treatment process will continue indefinitely. Lead gets into the drinking water after the water has been produced at the treatment plants. Nothing in the treatment process adds lead to the water, and the network of public water mains that transport the water to the homes does not add lead. Lead can only be introduced to the drinking water if lead service lines connect a residence to the water main, or if there's a galvanized pipe in a residence which has had a lead service line, if there is lead in solder joints in home plumbing, or if there is lead in plumbing fixtures in the homes. However, if the treatment plants have optional, excuse me, optimal corrosion control techniques, the possibility of lead leaching into the drinking water in the home can be very significantly reduced because the corrosion inhibitor creates a non-reactive surface inside the pipes and fixtures. To confirm analytical calculations and bench tests uh, of corrosion control chemistry, Washington Aqueduct built an array of lead pipe loops and set it up at the Dale Carlia Water Treatment Plant to mimic home water use conditions. Looking forward, this lead pipe loop array will be a test bed for analysis of the effects of any future change to water chemistry or treatment techniques. We will investigate thoroughly what happens to corrosion control. All of this will be evaluated by our consultants and then by the Environmental Protection Agency before any future treatment change is made. 
We have followed this review procedure with the ongoing change in the form of the disinfectant we use. Instead of having chlorine gas delivered to the water treatment plants, we are converting to the use of an aqueous form of chlorine known as sodium hypochlorite. We are confident that through precise water chemistry control, our customers can maintain compliance with the lead and copper rule. That confidence is based not only on science, but also on collaboration with our customers. We have the very best equipment for analyzing lead co concentrations, and we share the data with our wholesale customers. We have regular meetings to discuss water quality, and we get excellent feedback. Even with optimum corrosion control chemistry in a system that is fully compliant with the lead and copper rule, as long as there are homes with lead service lines, lead solder, or plumbing fixtures containing lead, the water delivers to those homes may pick up some concentration of lead. However, by following the directions that the District of Columbia Water and Sewer Authority has communicated to its customers, everyone living and working in the District of Columbia can confidently drink the water. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to offer this testimony, and I look forward to responding to any questions you or other, other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, you're now recognized for an opening statement for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Chaffetz, and my Congressman, Congressman Norton, it's a delight to be here today. My name is George Hawkins. Uh, for 16 years, uh, you would have heard the name D.C. Wassa for the enterprise I run. Just this morning, we changed the name to D.C. Water. Our new logo and new phrase can be seen here on the shirt. It is water is life. I'll come back to that. But it is not just a change in name. It is embodying the commitment we have to step forward and take proactive steps, not only for the health and welfare of every customer, every citizen, every resident, every visitor in this city, but every living thing in this city, because water is the fundamental of life. Just to clarify and to, to recap, we purchase our water from the aqueduct. Our friend Mr. Jacobus, a federal agency, treats the water. We purchase the water and distribute it to every uh, building in the city through 1,300 miles of pipes, 36,000 valves, pump system that is complicated throughout the city. I'd love to show you. Then once.